My name is uh, Judith Cohen. I am the photo archivist at the uh, Holocaust Museum, and it's a real uh, privilege to present the Joseph Eden Collection. The Joseph Eden Collection is one of our larger private collections. It consists of about uh, 10 archival boxes, of which there are photographs, photo albums, documents, reports, correspondence, and uh, publications. What interests me most about it on a personal level is that we often separate donors. So-and-so is a liberator. This person is a survivor. And the Joseph Eden collection is the story of one so-called Richie boy who's both on one hand a survivor. He himself had fled Nazi Germany, but also made an extraordinary contribution to the American war efforts. Joseph Eden grew up in Nuremberg, Germany and he escaped to the United States when he was still a child. But Joseph did very well in the United States, despite the fact that it was a new language. He went through high school, got a fellowship, a full scholarship to Cornell University, and was beginning graduate school when World War II broke out. Even though he was officially an enemy alien, he was conscripted into the U.S. Army and sent to Camp Ritchie in Maryland. Camp Ritchie was a special army base that was used to train native German speakers to do intelligence work in Germany. Shortly after completing Camp Ritchie, Joseph was sent to Europe as part of the 4th Mobile Broadcasting Unit. And his unit was responsible for PSYOPs, or psychological operations. It had two purposes. One was to collect information about what was going on in Germany and bring it back to Allied Headquarters, who was affiliated with Allied Headquarters. And second, and even more important, was to convey free information to the German people, both in the army and civilians. And they did that in two ways. They ran radio shows out of Radio Luxembourg with up-to-the-minute news, and they edited and distributed newspapers, something called the uh, Front Post that was a four-page newspaper that was dropped over Germany to civilians, and also a condensed version called the Felt Post that was sent by artillery shells into the front line. The papers carried two types of news. Uh, the main bulk of the news was just what's happening in the war, up-to-date news. Um, where are the units? Because there was an awareness that the news that was being produced in Nazi Germany was not accurate. It was all through the Nazi propaganda machine. But then in the back, there was also a lot of information on how do you surrender. And there was one article that said, German mothers tell your uh, sons to surrender. And some of them, in fact, had rules for surrender and said, if you come, we won't harm you. We just want you to put down your weapons. And I asked uh, Dr. Eden, I said, did this have any effect? And he said that, in fact, when they captured many soldiers, they had these uh, felt posts in their pocket and said, see, you've promised that you're going to treat me fairly. That we After the war ended, the PSYOPs unit continued its work in a very different way. The it Americans wanted to make sure that there was still accurate information being given to the German populace. The news, German newspapers from before were thoroughly Nazified. They were shut down. So every member of his unit became an editor of a local newspaper. So Joseph Eden, only 26 years old, became editor-in-chief. In fact, he was the only editor, only a reporter of the Regensburger Post. And these small newspapers got their national news from Army headquarters, and the last page was local news, which the individual editor had free reign to write stories, collect information, and write what he thought was most appropriate for his community. He also made his own efforts to denazify the area around it. The newspaper actually was printed in Straubing, which was a town right nearby, that had an intact printing press. The printing press in Regensburg had been destroyed in the war, so he operated out Straubing. In Straubing, 
there was a synagogue that had been desecrated on Kristallnacht. Joe went and found volunteers, volunteers in quotes, of the women whose husband had been responsible for the desecration. And he enlisted them and said, don't you think it would be a good idea if we cleaned up the synagogue? Of course, they didn't have much option but to agree to this. And they went, they cleaned up the synagogue. Uh, Josephine took photographs of them cleaning up the synagogue and then wrote a newspaper article about the rededication of the Straubing Synagogue. Another uh, way where he acted on his own volition has a much more personal tone and very poignant one. Because he was working in this very particular unit for the purpose of collecting information, he had access to his own vehicle. He had a jeep and he had a driver. Josephita knew enough to know that many German Jews had been deported to Theresienstadt and he made it his mission that he wanted to go and see if he could find any family members. When he arrived, he met Rabbi Leo Beck, who was the leader of German Jewry before the war and was interned and was a leader of the community in Theresienstadt. Rabbi Beck gave him a list of all the survivors in Theresienstadt, which he was able to bring back and then send through quarters so that people would know who was there since one of the main priorities after the war was to reunite people. He also came back with letters and was swamped by people who wanted him to take letters and send them to relatives, especially in the United States. And one of the most poignant parts of the Eden collection are letters that he received back from people in the United States saying, thank you, this is the first news I had that my sister is still alive. And he really had a major role in reunifying families in that sense.